Hello, I'm JJ Joaquin, and welcome to Philosophy and What Matters, where we discuss things that matter from a philosophical point of view. Now, today we will explore continental philosophy. Now, contemporary Western philosophy is often divided into two main traditions. On the one hand, you have the Anglo analytic tradition, which just characterizes the more scientific way of doing philosophy. Now, on the other hand, you have continental tradition, which emphasizes the more human way of doing philosophy. Now, compared to analytic philosophers, however, continental philosophers are caricatured as obscure and systematic and unrigorous. Now, is this characterization justified? Does the analytic continental divide even make sense? Now, to discuss what continental philosophy is and why it matters, we have Paul R. Patton, Emeritus Professor of Philosophy at the University of New South Wales, Professor of Philosophy at Yuan University and Flinders University. Hello, Professor Patton. Welcome to Philosophy and What Matters. Hello, JJ. <clears throat> it's a pleasure to, to be here. Okay, so before getting into our main topic, let's first discuss your philosophical background. How did you get into philosophy? So I started um, studying philosophy as an undergraduate at the University of Sydney uh, in the end of the 1960s, beginning of the 1970s. And I ended up um, doing an honors year in philosophy. Mm -hmm. um, the department of philosophy at Sydney at that time was uh, uh, entirely an analytic philosophy department. There was almost, there was no continental philosophy and very little history of philosophy. Mm -hmm. So I had teachers like David Armstrong in first year, um, Keith Campbell and others. Um, but it was also um, an intensely political period in universities in Australia, as indeed elsewhere. Um, it was the, <clears throat> the time of protests against the Vietnam War, mm -hmm. the emergence of feminism and other things. So it was a, a highly politicized environment. And in that context, um, it was it was Marx and Marxism that um, became a focus of my interest. Um, and it was really that through, um, through reading uh, contemporary Marxist philosophy um, that I discovered uh, continental traditions. Mm -hmm. And it was that in particular um, in Sydney, um, a group of us became very involved in reading the structural Marxism of Louis Althusser and his collaborators. Uh, and it was that interest in fact, that, that led me uh, to France um, in the mid-1970s, um, I stayed there and completed a PhD at the University of Paris 8 uh, and discovered um, a whole range of French philosophers other than uh, Althusser and the Althusserians that I had learned about in Sydney. So this mm -hmm. included people like Foucault and particularly um, Gilles Deleuze, who I subsequently translated and wrote a lot about um, the work of Jacques Derrida and others. No, oh, okay. So, so you're part of the split in the University of Sydney, so to speak. <laughs> yeah, look, I, I lived through the split um, uh -huh. uh, as, a, as a student and as a graduate student. And I, <clears throat> I think um, I had a, an interesting relation to that. I think I was probably the, the first um, graduate of the, um, the, the Department of General Philosophy, the so-called Radical um, Department. Mm -hmm. And because I, I took out a master's uh, degree in 1975 before going to, to Paris. Um, and then um, I was back working at Sydney through uh, the decade of the 1990s. So I also had the, um, the good fortune of being a member of the department uh, when that... Uh, that Unification. <laughs> All right. Was reunified. Yeah. All right. So in, in the University of Paris, you met some people. So who influenced you to pursue an academic career in philosophy? Yeah. Well, I think that decision uh, had probably already been taken um, when I accepted a graduate, a postgraduate um, research scholarship at the University of Sydney. So, mm -hmm. and that's what um, enabled me to complete a master's degree. Um, I was enrolled in a PhD, but then, went uh, to Paris uh, and realized I, I could apply there, got a scholarship from the French government and stayed on and yeah, finished um, 
a PhD in French, which uh, having done that, of course, yeah, then I was both committed to a career in philosophy and a career in, in continental philosophy. Mm. So why did you specialize in continental philosophy, given that you started with Armstrong, philosophy, Campbell, and so on? Yeah, yeah. Well, I think the, um, the, the political context that I mentioned, the social and political um, atmosphere at the time, and my, my interest was political philosophy, which um, was what led me to Marxism. It's only much later that I have um, become uh, quite interested in and involved in more analytic political philosophy. And that's been a focus of my work in recent in recent years. Um, but it was that interest in politics that really um, took me to French Marxism and to France. Um, and I guess the thinkers that I was interested in are ones who were, if not Marxist, um, you know, similarly um, historicist and political mm -hmm. thinkers. Now, incidentally, that time is also the cultural revolution in France, right? So the, the, yeah. the revolts of the student, student revolts. Yeah. Yeah. So it's the aftermath. What was the climate like in France then? Well, that was, uh, was fascinating. So um, yes, and I arrived there in 1975 and started going to classes at, at Paris 8 Vincennes. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was the university campus that was established by the French government uh, in response to a lot of the French student protests of 1968 and part of that was part of the protest was about the structure of higher education in France the centralization of universities around the Sorbonne and so on and um, in response to that and, and complaints about the curriculum uh, they established what was called an experimental University at Vincennes, um, but it was also, uh, from a political point of view, a place to um, to relocate uh, many of the uh, radical and otherwise <coughs> troublesome French philosophers. So, the philosophy department—I uh, mean, this was true of Vincennes in general—but the philosophy department was established by Foucault. He was appointed mm. to set up that department, and it included an extraordinary. Um, group of people, including Deleuze, including Jean-François Lyotard, including Alain Badiou, Jacques Rancière. These are all people who've become much more famous uh, since that time. But it, mm -hmm. was a, it was quite a stellar collection of um, French philosophers. So what was it like to be in the presence of these great uh, French philosophers? Well, that was also it was a very, you know, um, a very different experience from what I'd been used to in Sydney. So, um, uh, sorry, it was a. I mean, many of those people um, were trained in uh, the older style of French philosophy, what was called the uh, the corps magistral, which was the um, the method of teaching um, by distinguished philosophers that. Um, um, was simply a matter of them, you know, talking to students, very little interaction. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that was that was the, the sort of basic format. But then at Vincennes, you know, there was a whole um, um, democratization of the educational process movement. So, you know, those core magistrales of people like Deleuze uh, were regularly interrupted. Uh, they were challenged. They were criticized. So mm -hmm. it was a it was a fascinating um, environment to be in. Isn't it like the general philosophy curriculum in Sydney? Uh, it was, um, it was, I was going to say more radical in some ways. I mean, one of the things that distinguished the French, the experiment at Vincennes was that they abolished uh, progressivity in, in courses. So it was pretty much a, a free for all. Anyone could enroll in any, in any course um, that they were interested in. Um, that was, True to some extent at Sydney, but uh, but much less so. And the the range, you know, the the range of topics that were taught at Vincennes was uh, was extremely wide. So there were, you know, there were people, for example, giving courses on Chinese philosophy. There were um, um, courses on particular topics in social philosophy and political philosophy. Uh, there were, you know, standard classical courses on um, the history of philosophy. Mm -hmm. So. Um, the period that I was there and I discovered Deleuze at Vincennes uh, was the period in which he and his collaborator Felix Guattari were writing the book called um, 
a thousand plateaus, which <laughs> was itself a, um, uh, as a self-described philosophical experiment. Um, and that, yeah, that was um, unlike anything I had encountered um, before at Sydney or, or any other institution. <laughs> Okay, so let's get into our main topic. Let's uh, yeah. discuss the analytic continental divide first, mm. because I think you're a living testimony of that divide. So for you, what is this divide all about? Mm. Well, <clears throat> it's, um, I mean, I think it's, it's real in the sense that um, it's something that affects um, the views and the careers of young philosophers today. Um, it's taken seriously, particularly in the English speaking philosophical profession. Um, I think it's, it's taken less seriously outside um, that, um, that framework. Um, Simon Critchley um, in a little book on um, analytic, the analytic continental philosophy divide, says, you know, it's a little bit um, like ordering a continental breakfast in Paris or Madrid. Um, mm -hmm. People would just look at you strangely and wonder what, what you were saying. So, which is a way of saying that it's a very, a very Anglo-centered and Anglo-centric uh, characterization um, that doesn't always make a lot of sense outside the Anglosphere. Um, but nevertheless, you know, within the profession, uh, it's real and it has consequences. Um, it's much more difficult to try and give an intellectual explanation and uh, justification of the divide. Um, you know, it, um, you know, people try to make sense of it. I mean, in geographic terms, it doesn't make sense because there is uh, plenty of so-called analytic philosophy in continental Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, in, and increasingly, it doesn't make sense either in terms of the, the origins or training of the people concerned. Um, partly because so-called continental philosophy has become uh, a significant um, approach or series of approaches um, in the English speaking world in, in North America and in, in Britain, Australia and elsewhere. So it's, it, it's hard to pin down. So then it, then it comes down to, um, to particular traditions, I guess, uh, in the history of philosophy um, and you know, the history of, of analytic philosophy itself is, is quite, um, specific in that regard. You know, it's a movement that emerged in the earlier 20th century, uh, focused around uh, Vienna initially, um, uh, Cambridge and Oxford at later periods. Um, so, and it was uh, a distinct, uh, I mean, it was both an embrace of, uh, of formal logic, uh, uh, logic and science mm -hmm. uh, as the, the model and the, um, the methodological inspiration for philosophy. And a deliberate reaction against um, some forms of um, of phenomenological thought, uh, the work of Heidegger uh, in particular. Um, oh. So, you know, one can tell the story in those terms of how how these distinct traditions emerged and how they um, how they hardened. And I, I think that's the one of the things that I learned most from the experience of the division, the, the departmental split at Sydney, is that once once these divisions become established in a profession or in a discipline, they become self-reinforcing and self-reproducing. Mm. Um, and, and that, um, I think, uh, is, uh, is an unfortunate uh, consequence of those things, uh, particularly unfortunate from an intellectual point of view. So I guess my final comment is that um, I don't take it seriously as a mm -hmm. as an intellectual divide, and I think there are many signs that that's increasingly the case that um, analytically trained philosophers uh, come to read so-called continental thinkers. Um, continental thinkers, you know, bring more analytic uh, approaches uh, to um, the reading of, of continental thinkers, and I, I think there are a number of spheres we can talk about some of these later. Um, in contemporary philosophy that are the product of this kind of, um, you know, cross, uh, cross factional uh, mm -hmm. approach and collaboration. Okay, so, but where did we get this notion, this divide in the first place? What's the history behind it? Well, I mean, part of it is that uh, <clears throat> there is that history that I alluded to of, um, of uh, the Vienna Circle and its impacts in English speaking philosophy um, mm -hmm. in the uh, early 20th century, particularly in the period after the First World War. Um, and I think, um, I mean, that had a lot to do with the success of the analytic movement, the work of 
of Bertram Russell, of A.J. Eyre and others uh, in Britain uh, in that period. Uh, and that was, you know, um, very self-consciously an attempt by a new generation of British philosophers to distinguish themselves from their more um, uh, Hegelian and idealistic predecessors uh, in Britain at the time. So, you know, I mean, one part of the story is that um, that familiar uh, phenomenon of a new generation of philosophers seeking to distinguish themselves from their, their predecessors. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's, it's a complicated um, genealogy that gets overlain with a number of other things. Uh, one of them is the, um, the kind of cultural stereotypes that come into play in the difference between British Anglophone culture and so-called continental European. Mm -hmm. And that was undoubtedly affected by the um, antagonisms provoked by the First and then the Second World War. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, much of the, you know, the familiar commonplace ways in which the analytic continental philosophy divide is, is talked about, um, like, you know, the, the clarity and rigor of analytic philosophy, as opposed to the uh, woolly headed abstraction mm -hmm. Um, of continental philosophy. I mean, this is a um, straightforward cultural stereotype that, yeah. that has a longer history. Um, and I, I guess the final thing uh, that I would draw attention to in that, that history is the, the intensification of that division in the period after the Second World War. Mm -hmm. And in that context, um, it was also caught up with, with the cultural politics of the Cold War. And mm -hmm. again, a kind of, uh, in that I think particularly played out in the um, the um, the animus against um, political philosophy and against philosophy concerned with political and more broadly existential questions about life and the nature of life. So that um, effort, and again, this has been written about the transformation of philosophy into a technical discipline. Um, modeled on the natural sciences. Uh, that was very much a, um, an enterprise of uh, post-war and especially North American philosophy. Okay, so do you think that this kind of divide, the analytic continental divide, is still useful in today's academic atmosphere and philosophical scene? <clears throat> uh, no, I mean, I think that it is fundamentally and, you know, it's a, an anti-intellectual um, Mm -hmm. division uh, that is um, that is not good uh, for philosophy or for philosophy for students of philosophy. Um, I think it has no particular uh, intellectual basis or justification. There are, you know, one can't identify any particular um, methodological um, feature that, uh, th that would neatly divide analytic from continental philosophy that wouldn't be reproduced on either side of, of that division. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's uh, it's broadly it's a it's a hindrance to thought, and I think um, um, it's it's not helpful. Uh, in fact, you know, more strongly, it, it's unhelpful. Um, and again, I would um, turn into what I suggested a while ago. Some of the more interesting developments in philosophy uh, in recent years have been precisely um, brought about by the kind of. Uh, fertilization across those two traditions. And I, I think that's true in, in a number of areas. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's get dig deeper into continental philosophy. Now you mentioned about Heidegger, Husserl, and your French philosophers, your French teachers, Foucault, yeah. Derrida, and so on. And a host of other uh, philosophers who are classified as continental philosophers. But given the variety of philosophical discussions, does it even make sense to bundle them into one super category of continental philosophy? Um, again, in intellectual terms, I think it doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, and that's what I was alluding to earlier in saying that it's a, um, bound up with cultural stereotypes. It's a very Anglo-centric um, mm -hmm. attitude um, to, to you know, non-Anglophone philosophy. But, and just as um, as analytic philosophy is an extremely broad church with many um, <laughs> different approaches, different currents, uh, you know, antagonism within it. So, I mean, you know, think of the the fate of Wittgenstein and the, and the work of the later Wittgenstein, uh, which has been enormously influential, but uh, for some is anathema and not not philosophy. This is within the the analytic camp. Uh, 
I think the same is also true in, in so-called continental philosophy, that um, it's a, a very broad church. There are a number of quite distinct uh, traditions, genealogies, approaches to philosophy mm -hmm. um, within that. I mean, the, um, the broadly phenomenological and existential tradition that goes from perhaps uh, Hegel to Husserl, Heidegger, um, mm -hmm. contemporaries like Levinas and Jean-Paul Sartre, Simone de Beauvoir. Uh, that's a tradition that's very different, say, from the, um, the, the structuralist tradition that developed in France in the 1960s. Um, there is, um, as Foucault was fond of pointing out, you know, even within French philosophy, there are divisions between uh, those who were um, based on or developed out of that phenomenological tradition on the one hand, and um, a tradition of of philosophy of science, of the history and philosophy of science that uh, Foucault and Foucault's, um, Foucault's mentor, Georges Conguillem, were, were very much a part of. So, so it's, yeah, I mean, all of which is to say, I think that continental philosophy is an extremely varied field and it's not, um, it's not an intellectually helpful category by itself. <laughs> okay, so you mentioned about different schools of thought here. So mm -hmm. uh, the phenomenological existential tradition stemming from Hegel, perhaps, mm -hmm. down to mm -hmm. Heidegger, to Sartre, and so on. And also mm -hmm. the French school, the structuralist, uh, structuralist school of Foucault, and so yeah. on. But mm -hmm. are there other schools of thought here? The, the Althusser line, what is that line of philosophizing? Uh, Althusser, did you say? Yeah. Yes. Um, yes, there are. So, and there, are, as I'm sure you know, there are many ways of um, of carving up the history of philosophy. Um, so, and one of the divisions um, you know, coming from Marxism is materialism versus idealism. Mm -hmm. um, so, there are within that 19th century um, um, tradition that I alluded to. I mean, um, there is the tradition of German idealism. Uh, and there, are, there is a, uh, another series of so-called materialist thinkers, beginning with Feuerbach, with Marx. Mm -hmm. um, some would include Nietzsche in that tradition um, through to 20th century thinkers. Um, that's one way of dividing it up. Another um, is um, in terms of um, what, are so, what are sometimes called philosophers of imminence as opposed to philosophers of transcendence, the mm -hmm. notion of a transcendent being um, um, the Christian God and theological tradition plays an important role here. But then, and this is getting back to, to Althusser, there is a tradition of so-called um, non-transcendent mm -hmm. or immanentist thinkers uh, that include Spinoza, for example, for whom, for whom God and nature um, are one and the same. And Althusser um, was very much uh, a follower of that tradition. Um, mm -hmm the so-called immanentist thinker. So he explicitly invoked Spinoza uh, in relation to his um, reformulation of Marxist philosophy. Uh, Nietzsche is another thinker who, um, who adopted Spinoza as his, um, his predecessor in the history of philosophy, even though he never wrote about nor, nor indeed read much of Spinoza's work. But uh, <laughs> Nietzsche is often aligned with that tradition. And again, to, to jump forward to some of the other uh, French thinkers, uh, Foucault, Deleuze, uh, in particular, uh, are often associated with that uh, tradition of, um, of imminent as, as opposed to transcendent thought. And, yeah. So yes, there are a number of other traditions, and there are others that I haven't mentioned at all. That, um, I've talked about 19th century German idealism, uh, talked a little bit about the uh, phenomenological and existential tradition that, that was often taken to include um, Kierkegaard, Nietzsche, and, and others. Uh, there is uh, the tradition of so-called um, hermeneutic philosophy um, mm -hmm. uh, that developed in the late 19th century uh, and, and that is still quite, uh, quite strong in some areas today. Um, there are, I've talked a little bit about Marx, but then there are, there are a whole series of varieties of European Marxism. Um, uh, the, the German... Um, tradition of so-called critical thought based around the um, the Frankfurt School of Adorno and Horkheimer in the early oh. 20th century. Again, these are these are quite distinct and flourishing traditions in their own right. Mm 
So what are these schools of thought? Can you give us a bird's eye view of the main ideas of these the different contemporary continental philosophies? No, it's very hard uh, to summarize the main ideas. I mean, I've been talking <laughs> about in terms of, uh, of genealogies or, or traditions, I suppose. Mm. Um, For example, what's the main idea of a Derridean philosopher or a follower of Lyotard or those mm. philosophers? So what's the yeah. ag agenda, their philosophical agenda? Yeah, okay. So that's easier to do in the case of, uh, of particular thinkers. So um, Derrida is an, is an interesting case. So Derrida described himself uh, until, you know, throughout his career as a, as a phenomenologist. So mm -hmm. his, um, his early work, um, decades of his early career was spent working on Husserl uh, and Heidegger and that tradition. And um, that is a tradition uh, focused very much on human consciousness on the you know the foundational elements of human consciousness and how they determine oh. our thought um, but in Derrida uh, obviously developed uh, a project a program of his own um, which was and um, I mean I guess one way to summarize it would be to say that what what Derrida was concerned about was um, was uncertainty or ambiguity, or uh, to use the term that he um, popularized, aporia. Aporia, yeah. Right. Uh, philosophy is often, particularly analytic philosophy, is concerned uh, <clears throat> to dissolve contradictions, to deal, to resolve or dissolve contradictions, uh -huh. um, <clears throat> to deal with aporia. Derrida's approach is is the inverse. You know, it, it is about um, exploring, developing uh, aporia uh -huh. uh, in in a variety of ways, and this is. You know what has led to um, uh, you know, criticisms of Derrida that this is a, a philosophy of, of impotence. It's a philosophy that <laughs> you know fundamental values like truth. Mm. Um, whereas you know others would say, I mean, defenders would say, well, you know, Derrida is not opposed to truth. He doesn't deny the existence of truth. But what he's what he's interested in is what what it means and how um, how our understandings of truth have developed. You know what are what are the basic um, conditions of distinguishing truth from untruth and, and you know he's someone who um, in his in his own terms is very much concerned with pursuing these questions these fundamental questions of the the basis uh, and the limits of philosophy so you know what is it that distinguishes philosophical inquiry from let's say literary or artistic thought um, mm -hmm. Uh, all of which, you know, makes him, I mean, I think both an extraordinarily rigorous philosopher, because in, in much of his work, which is you know, detailed, very close reading and analysis of texts from the history of philosophy, um, he is an extraordinarily um, analytical thinker, mm -hmm. uh, but um, one uh, who never reaches a, a determinate conclusion. So, you know, I mean, the the, re, the repeated uh, upshot of, of his analyses is drawing attention to the contradictions, the aporia of a particular thinker, a particular text, mm -hmm. uh, or a particular set of ideas. Um, and this, yeah, this um, sometimes frustrates and irritates other people. Um, <laughs> right. That's why, he, that's why Coin and others were against his honorary degree, right? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that that's an episode. I mean, I think it's one of the more unfortunate and shameful episodes of recent analytic philosophy, um, mm -hmm. and one that I know quite a bit about um, because I was at Sydney at the time, along with some of the signatories uh, like Keith Campbell. Uh, <laughs> okay. And and it and it's quite clear that these people um, had not read any Derrida. I mean, they they simply uh, mm -hmm. took it uh, on face value on on the reports of others that. Um, um, you know, that he was guilty of the things that they charged him with. And, I, you know, um, it's unfortunate because it's unsustainable. I mean, it's, it's an unphilosophical attitude to condemn mm. someone uh, on the basis of complete ignorance of their writings. So there's a recent biography of Derrida that's just been published in the UK that I was reading about. Uh, and the author, um, it's called An Event Perhaps, published by Verso. Mm -hmm. and the author uh, points out that the one of the... Um, you know, the um, expressions uh, referred to in that letter, that Cambridge letter, uh, they talked about logical fallacies, spelled with 
ballots rather than palaces. <laughs> uh, this was never this was mm. never um, a phrase that Derrida used. So mm. who knows where it came from? But. So yeah, look, it's unfortunate. And there, I think we go, you know, we go back to the kind of cultural stereotypes that um, I was talking about at the beginning, and and the fact that uh, as others, uh, Simon Glendinning, for example, uh, who's also written on this divide, suggests. Um, the term continental philosophy just becomes a, a kind of marker, uh, a term of abuse and an excuse. It provides an excuse for not reading particular thinkers. So it's, mm. a, it's a deeply unphilosophical attitude, uh, it seems to me. Okay, so we talked about Derrida. How about Foucault? So what is Foucault's main agenda? What's the project here? Mm. So um, that's a um, very interesting question to raise. So Foucault, um, is often described as a, a genealogist, um, mm. a philosopher whose work undertakes genealogies of certain of, of a certain kind. Um, and in that regard, um, he in interviews and other places often uh, aligns his own work with that of Nietzsche. So the Nietzsche of the genealogy of morality as it's now translated. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Foucault, um, became best known for uh, works that were um, genealogies of institutions and ways of thinking. So the, the book that was um, initially published as Madness and Civilization, abbreviated form uh, in English, uh, now fully translated. Um, this is Foucault's um, uh, thesis for the, doc the state doctorate. Um, mm. uh, it's a massive book and it's a, it's a genealogy, if you like, of insanity or madness and mm. that encompasses both the history of ways of understanding madness or unreason or mm. irrationality uh, in European culture from the Middle Ages um, up to the 20th century, uh, but also a genealogy of the institution of the asylum itself and the various mm. ways of dealing with and treating uh, the insane. Uh, and that, that's a very you know, interesting pro uh, book in itself that um, uh, is both a, a history of discourses about madness. It's a history of uh, the institutions, the ways of dealing with, and it, it, it encapsulates much of Foucault's later work. Mm -hmm. um, you know, similar genealogies of uh, the hospital uh, in a book called The Birth of the Clinic, mm -hmm. uh, a genealogy of, um, of the prison and Sorry. modern forms of punishment in discipline and punish. Um, so there is that kind of uh, institutional genealogy, but there's also the intellectual genealogy uh, in Foucault's work. And that um, has uh, involved him to write um, studies of, of the history and prehistory of particular um, bodies of knowledge. So the book called The Order of Things uh, talks about uh, the different forms of knowledge of life, language and labor. Uh, again, in in Europe, very much in the early modern period. I mean, his his field, his historical field, um, for a long time uh, was very much from the end of the Middle Ages up to modernity, if you like, to the nineteenth century. Yeah. Um, and he did, you know, the history of particular sciences in that period. Um, in later years, he came to this project of a history of sexuality, uh, which again was intended to be a genealogy of of modern sexuality, and it's an interesting and complicated question, just what he meant there by <laughs> sexuality. And again, he meant both the bodies of knowledge, the ways of understanding human sexuality, but also the ways of dealing with it, the forms of treatment, medical, um, psychiatric, and others. Um, mm. um, and, you know, one of, um, one of the threads of that project was arguably a, a genealogy of um, uh, of modern psychiatry and indeed, um, you know, uh, Freudian understandings of, um, mm. okay, uh, of so. human nature. So, but so uh, just just to conclude on on Foucault's project, I mean, it's a it's a genealogical project in that sense, and it's a as he later describes it, you know, it's a way of trying to understand um, understand our present, understand who we are, what kind of. Um, what kinds of subject, what kinds of institutions, what kinds of knowledge mm. uh, define us, um, but also, um, you know, with a with a critical dimension, with a view to identifying um, the points of fragility, the points at which those uh, modern forms of human self-understanding can be 
changed, can be transformed. Okay, let's turn to some other uh, schools of thought in continental philosophy, like mm. the Habermas tradition or the Frankfurt mm. School. So what is that all about? What, the, what is the main agenda of that philosophical tradition? Um, again, I would say it's, um, that's a tradition that has um, developed um, in a much closer relation to Marx and Marxism and the, tra mm -hmm. the Marxist tradition of thought. Uh, that was its origin. Uh, and again, I would say that its, um, its principal concern is um, this question of understanding the present. So um, mm -hmm. understanding the nature of modernity, if you like, uh, and um, um, the uh, very much bound up with Marx's understanding of, of capitalism as mm -hmm. the defining economic condition of modern life, but then um, the Frankfurt School in particular is concerned, was concerned with um, how that extends into other areas of, of culture. I mean, how, uh, in the case of Habermas himself, I mean, that was his, uh, his point of departure. I mean, Habermas is, um, again, someone who's developed a, a quite distinct um, intellectual project. And in his case, um, a focus of that was the uh, effort to, to develop um, non-metaphysical but nonetheless universal ways of understanding the human condition mm -hmm. and for him uh, a focus of that was communication the fact that humans are language using animals uh, and his concern um, his his discourse philosophy or um, philosophy of communication was an attempt to identify the uh, the universal presuppositions of human language use uh, and that you know, that was a, a focus of his project, became the basis of his attempt to develop a, a political philosophy. Mm -hmm. um, on again, on the basis of these non-metaphysical but nonetheless universal um, conditions of possibility of um, human communication. So there's a strong Kantian dimension um, to uh, to Habermas's project. Um, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Yeah. It, interesting because. Uh, in the history of 20th century philosophy, there's an interaction between Habermas and John Rawls and yeah, yeah. Derrida and Davidson to some extent. Yes, yes. And Popko and who's this guy? Chomsky. <laughs> yeah. No, so yeah, there's yeah, yeah there's a, that interaction, but it's not really acknowledged in some of our discourses that there's this interaction between analytic philosophers on the one hand and continental philosophers yes. on the other hand. Yes, there is. Um, yeah, and again, the examples you point to are, are pertinent. Um, I mean, the habermas rawls uh, exchange has been the subject of, uh, of a couple of recent books. Um, mm -hmm. One published just recently by, um, by um, Finlayson uh, is a detailed discussion of that encounter as a defining moment in 20th century political philosophy. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, you know, um, I think uh, beneath it, there are um, you know, deeper and more wide ranging engagements between so-called analytic and continental political philosophy in Rawls's work. So now that uh, Rawls's lectures on the history of philosophy, his lectures on political philosophy are published, uh, it's possible to see, for example, the degree to which Rawls, this paradigmatic analytic um, political philosopher, uh, was a... Um, um, a careful and you know deep reader, mm. not only Marx and Hegel, but of figures like Rousseau. So mm. there is good reason to to see <clears throat> Rawls's work, particularly Rawls's later political philosophy, as uh, as deeply influenced by uh, elements of the continental tradition. The the other example you mentioned uh, to go back to Foucault is an interesting one that I was going to to talk about. I mean, I think there are apart from these kind of um, well known um, staged confrontations between particular thinkers like the Rawls Habermas debate or the Foucault Chomsky debate, um, mm -hmm. some of the more interesting developments in contemporary philosophy uh, have taken up, um, you know, um, aspects of the approach of either. So, and, and one of these is genealogy. I mean, it's quite striking to me how much um, the question of genealogy and genealogical approaches um, mm -hmm. uh, to, to knowledge, uh, to morality, to 
um, a, a variety of things have become uh, issues in otherwise analytic philosophy. Mm. So the, the question of genealogical explanation is now um, a, a serious topic of debate. Um, there are those who defend it, and of course, you know, there are, there are different ways of approaching genealogy. One of the I've talked a little bit about Foucault and the um, uh, acknowledgement of Nietzsche's influence on his way of doing genealogy. Mm. But um, that's not the only way in the history of philosophy. There is also Hume. Uh, there is the tradition of so-called vindicatory genealogy yeah. that derived from David Hume uh, and that is developed, say, in the work of Bernard Williams. Mm -hmm. uh, and a number of, uh, of contemporary thinkers have taken up this approach, uh, tried to develop its links to pragmatism. Uh, so I think, and this is uh, to go back to something I said earlier, I think it's one of the ways in which some of the most interesting areas in contemporary philosophy, uh, you know, the cross tradition, as it were, in terms of the analytic continental divide. Yeah, so actually the interaction between Paul Rick or Gadamer and some mm. analytic philosophers of the self, like Derek mm. Martin and so on. So there, there's a yeah, yeah. huge interaction there as well. But how yeah. about your professor, uh, Gilles Deleuze, what's yeah. his main project? What's the main agenda of his philosophy? Mm. So um, Deleuze um, is uh, one of those French thinkers, you know, trained in the history of philosophy. Um, and I guess if um, I was talking earlier about the um, opposition that's sometimes drawn, particularly in, in the French tradition between the thinkers of imminence and the thinkers of transcendence. And I mm. think Deleuze is very much um, uh, in that tradition of the thinkers of imminence. Uh, and he wrote a, um, a large book, one of his um, uh, one of his thesis texts was a, a large book on Spinoza. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and he also wrote a book on Nietzsche. So um, he is very much in that tradition of uh, um, philosophies of of imminence. Um, the other thinker that he was um, deeply influenced by is Bergson. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, I mean, Deleuze um, is, is difficult to sum up in terms of a project, um, just because um, his own self conception was um, that of a, as he said, famously said in an interview with Claire Panet, um, he wasn't a philosopher who had a project, a single yeah. project. He yeah. wrote, uh, I mean, you know, exaggerating, he said every time he started a new book, he started again from ground zero, you know, no, no intellectual history, no intellectual capital. I mean, mm. that, that's clearly hyperbole, but I think there is something to the point that, um, you know, he uh, undertook different projects at different periods. Um, I, for me, um, the most interesting project in Deleuze's work uh, is the explicitly experimental project in, in uh, A Thousand Plateaus. And this is um, a work of philosophy that um, he later described. He wrote a kind of um, reflective book on that project uh, mm -hmm. and his conception of philosophy called What is Philosophy? Um, with Guattari published not long before his death in 1995. It was published in 92 in mm -hmm. French. Um, and there in that book, he describes philosophy um, very simply. Philosophy is creating concepts. He says, that's what philosophy is. That's what philosophy does. Mm -hmm. And um, that's, you know, he, he gives some examples from the history of philosophy and the ways in which, you know, the um, canonical history of European philosophy can be um, thought about in those terms. But what he and Guattari tried to do in world's philosophy was um, to... Um, to create uh, new concepts or uh, concepts of a new kind. And I think this is um, what, one of the intriguing things. I mean, concepts um, are in philosophy are widely understood as, um, as stable. You know, they are fixed and well-defined ways of making sense of the world. One of the things that Deleuze uh, and Guattari were trying to do in what is philosophy is to, to think about concepts differently and to think about um, what they called mobile concepts or concepts that are subject to fluctuation and change. They're fluid and, concepts. Fluid, exactly. Yeah. They're fluid. And this is where partly the Bergsonian uh, mm. influence in Deleuze's um, thinking. But so, you know, um, that book, A Thousand Plateaus, is this kind of profusion, proliferation of concepts, um, you know, 
machinic assemblages, you know, machines of desire, yeah. um, you know, state machines, all kinds of things um, um, uh, that they define and uh, and modify, as it were, over the course of the book, A Thousand Plateaus. And it, it's quite explicitly a book that has no particular beginning and no end. You know, it's in the middle of a process that can mm -hmm. continue in a variety of ways. So it's a... Uh, I think it's an intriguing and fascinating uh, project that um, has not really been uh, understood. I mean, it hasn't really been um, written about or, or thought about uh, in relation to that kind of philosophical project. A lot of the focus has been on the surface, as it were, the kinds of examples they use, things like mm. nomads and nomadology and stuff. Mm. But um, actually coming to terms with it as an experiment, a philosophical experiment, as Deleuze understood it, I think has, uh, has yet to happen. But, Okay, so we barely touched on a lot of topics in continental mm. philosophy. So we have not touched on Heidegger's philosophy no. and Sartre's philosophy and so on. But could you tell us something about your recent work on political philosophy, especially your work on the rights of indigenous people? Mm. I reckon that you draw a lot of insights from continental sources and analytic yeah. ones as well. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, no, you're right. Just beginning, there's a lot of traditions we haven't talked about. You know, we haven't talked much about um, about um, so-called uh, continental feminist philosophy, uh, mm. which again is a, is a large field, influenced by a variety of these thinkers, from from de Beauvoir to to students of Derrida, like uh, Ivo Garay, um, to yeah, others like Michel Le Duff and so on. But um, so there is a lot uh, that we haven't covered. But in terms of my own work which has been increasingly focused, I mentioned earlier, on political philosophy. And um, it, it was only in the last um, two or three decades that I started to read more widely in analytic political philosophy, and particularly the work of Rawls and others in the Rawlsian tradition. Mm -hmm. So, um, and it's in that context that I, um, and because of developments in Australia around um, the rights of Aboriginal people uh, to land, uh, to culture, uh, and uh, particularly um, jurisprudential developments in relation to um, to so-called native title or Aboriginal title, um, that I've started to write. I, I began to write a lot about about these issues. But um, here too, my um, my resources in doing it were um, were not exclusively continental. Um, the thinkers um, who wrote about these issues in English language political philosophy were initially mainly Canadian. Uh, there yeah. were figures like Will Kimlicker, yeah. um, James Tully, um, both of whom are you know, exclusively, as it were, analytically trained. Uh, Tully more in the history of um, political thought, um, but but Kimlicker very much in the Rawlsian and post Rawlsian tradition of analytic political thought. So you know these were some of the starting points in thinking about rights and Aboriginal rights. Yeah. Um, I think. And it led me to a number of things. I mean, there are certainly elements of continental thought that um, that I found useful in that. Uh, one of them uh, is not so much Deleuze, but Derrida. And this is to go back to that question of aporia. Yeah. The problem um, that became apparent in Australian law, uh, Australian jurisprudence, uh, is this, uh, this very straightforward aporia of a colonized indigenous people yeah. seeking uh, to reassert rights uh, in the legal system, the legal framework uh, of the colonizing power. So, you know, there is this, uh, this aporia uh, at the heart of the notion of uh, Aboriginal rights that I found um, Derrida useful to think about. And, and just more generally um, in thinking about justice, um, analytic political philosophy's approach to justice has been largely focused on distributive justice. Mm -hmm. But when, uh, and that's important um, and, and has direct application to the situation of colonized indigenous people uh, who are always amongst the most disadvantaged um, peoples of the, the countries established on their territories, whether it's in North America, Australia or elsewhere. But there's, there's this other dimension to the, the problem of colonization and decolonization Mm -hmm. which is very much um, a problem about the relationship, the relationship of uh, a, a, a European-derived people and culture to an indigenous people and culture. And this, um, I think, you know, is a relation of um, a particular culture to an other or to its other, mm. and how that, how that other should be understood and how the relationship to others should be um, 
um, approached how it should be dealt with. And here again, others like Levinas for whom um, the, the focus of ethical and political thought is this relation to the other. Um, you know, I found this helpful in thinking about about the problems of colonization and colonized indigenous people. And the, uh, the final comment um, I would make is that this thinking about this has led me to, to think about other issues in political philosophy, like the very notion of rights, you know, what is a right and how do, how do we come to have rights. And here, um, there are ways of thinking about this in the analytic philosophy of rights, which is extremely ahistorical, you know, that rights are derived from some, some given feature <coughs> of of human nature, mm -hmm. um, sentience, for example, or the fact that human beings, um, you know, make projects, uh, that they're project um, living animals, uh, and rights are to be understood in relation to that. But um, what I have found more useful and more helpful, uh, again, is, is the historicism of Foucault and the, mm -hmm. the genealogical approach. And I, I defended the view, which is very unpopular, <laughs> that, uh, that rights are a product of historical circumstance. So, you mm -hmm. know, I take seriously the idea that uh, indigenous peoples in Australia and elsewhere nowadays do have rights. They have rights to land, they have rights to culture and other things. These are contested, but they are nonetheless accepted. In the 19th century, they didn't have those rights. You know, mm. I mean, it makes no sense to say that that the rights existed. As some some philosophers, you know, bite the bullet and say, "Well, yeah, the rights existed. They were just not understood or recognised at the time." Mm. I think that's just you know, makes no sense. Whatever <laughs> the um, the history of uh, of treatment of institutional treatment of laws and attitudes and other things. I mean, I think it's more interesting to think about how rights uh, come into being. Uh, and how rights go out of being. You know, there are lots of historical examples of rights. Think, for example, of the rights of husbands over wives, which were, you know, part of European culture, British law up until the 19th century. Uh, these rights no longer exist. You know, uh, mm. husbands no longer have those rights over their wives and families that they once had. Um, so, you know, rights are historical phenomena, and they need to be understood uh, as such. So that. Um, you know, that is a way in which yeah, my thinking about um, an issue in political philosophy uh, is directly influenced by um, the continental tradition. Philosophy. Yeah, that's a different way of thinking about rights, because, for, yeah. for example, in the social contract theory, you have natural rights. Yeah, okay. that's right. According to your view, the mm. historical coincidence or actually there are more contingent yes. cultural artifacts, so to speak. Yeah. Right. So, Yes, that's right. And I think, you know, again, this goes back to, to Foucault. I mean, this is uh, in later interviews, you know, in talking about the his conception of philosophy, this genealogical approach. Mm. One of the things that he focused on was this understanding of present, uh, present institutions, present ways of thinking as contingent. And, you know, that, that doesn't mean discardable, it doesn't mean unimportant, um, mm. but it, being aware of, of those things as contingent, I think does... Uh, does have consequences. And in the case of rights, I think, um, you know, it, it has, uh, it, one of the things it does is to make us aware of the, the contingency that the rights we take for granted, mm. um, you know, need to be defended, need to be protected, uh, if we want them to, to continue. Okay. So what lessons could we still learn from continental philosophy? What's the, or what's the future of continental philosophy for you? Mm. Look, I, I think from my point of view, um, the future is um, is not a future of continental philosophy, but a future of you know the development of of new approaches, new ways of thinking about particular issues or particular problems mm. uh, that that draw on analytic as well as continental traditions in philosophy. So, I mentioned earlier, you know the the emergence of renewed interest in genealogy and genealogical ways of doing philosophy. And, and I think this is a, an approach um, to social, political, and other issues that normative issues generally, that can be usefully informed by thinkers on, from both analytic and continental traditions. So I'm, I think I'm, you know, more interested in, in that, you know, the emergence of particular ways of thinking or particular ways of thinking about particular problems that, uh, that draw on elements of both uh, 
analytic and communal philosophy. And I, I think uh, in that respect, you know, the, the divide, I think, is also a historical phenomenon that will probably fade and will probably, you know, in time <laughs> become as... Um, as quaint to us now as those who insist on, you know, materialism versus idealism as the defining <laughs> Okay, so uh, on a more personal note, you've been an mm. academic for the longest time. Yeah. You've been a philo professional philosopher, well, for several years now, several mm. decades now. Decades. So what's your advice for those who want to get into uh, academic philosophy, professional academic philosophy? Uh, look, I, you know, um, fairly standard advice. I mean, I think um, it is increasingly difficult uh, to um, to develop a career in professional philosophy. Um, I mean, to go back to contingency, um, we've just endured, we've uh, experienced a long period of um, in um, Western uh, countries of uh, a support for philosophy in the um, educational institution. So philosophy has been an accepted and enduring part of universities. Mm. Um, I'm not sure that one can assume that that will continue, um, which uh, again, I don't think means the death of philosophy or the disappearance of philosophy, but it does mean that um, those undertaking career perhaps need to be, um, need to be more um, open-minded, more experimental, more adventurous about the ways in which they might seek to develop a philosophy career. Mm. Uh, I was um, recently uh, interested in the the topic of so-called field philosophy. I don't know if this is something that you've become aware of, but it's a, a book uh, by a couple of American academics um, arguing that philosophy in particular has painted itself into a bit of a corner by trying to establish itself as a standalone discipline with mm -hmm. no relations to um, to other bodies and in a way that makes it uh, particularly vulnerable in uh, in the contemporary university and, and given the increasing insistence on on engagement with um, you know non intellectual non academic activities mm -hmm. business for example um, so uh, the authors, uh, Froedeman and um, I forget the other guy's name, um, oh. developed the notion of what they call field philosophy, which is which is modelled on anthropology, if you like. It's about philosophers um, working as embedded um, thinkers uh, in other projects, whether um, whether these are social political projects like environmental um, activism mm -hmm. or whether they are you know commercial or uh, industrial projects so you know this idea of uh, a philosophy as an activity that can and should be carried out in conjunction with other intellectual and uh, intellectual and practical activities i think is an interesting one um, so um, that, that's all of that just to say that one shouldn't assume that the the current institutional framework of um, academic philosophy will continue in the same form. Uh, and I think anyone starting out today needs to be aware of that. Mm -hmm. uh, but apart from that, you know, my, my tips would be the standard ones, which is to, um, to, <clears throat> to publish and publish in, in good, good outlets, good journals or good publishers. Um, it would be to, um, to read widely uh, but also to develop specialisms uh, you know to <clears throat> building a career in academic philosophy is um, uh, requires a certain kind of, um, of self-development uh, and self-marketing and I think <laughs> one needs to be aware of that as well it's you know there's an older um, an idea that I came across a lot in my academic career of philosophers um, and from but interestingly both analytic and continental philosophers who had this extraordinary view of the the value of philosophy and its its right to be carried out at the taxpayer's expense um you know regardless of of its outcomes and you know it it struck me and it's a view that in, increasingly came under challenge but an extraordinary view and an unworldly view i mean philosophers um, you know, sometimes do make a virtue of their unworldliness. And I think, um, I think that's uh, increasingly difficult to sustain in the institutional environment. I mean, fine, if you want to be a, um, a private philosopher, I mean, you know, philosopher on your own time. And indeed, there are um, many I know who've done that, who've, 
sustained an intellectual career in philosophy and publishing and writing philosophy by other means, you know, and again, that has a, a long tradition going back to Spinoza, who mm. made his living uh, as a lens maker, as we all know. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's another option, you know, just finding finding a, a, an income earning activity that will leave you time for um, philosophical reflection. Um, so, yeah, look, I mean, and as for the value of doing it, I mean, again, I defend it enormously. I think, I think whether or not one becomes a professional philosopher, there is, um, there is a lot of value in learning to think philosophically and learning to, and that means both, you know, thinking clearly and logically, but it also, I think, means thinking reflectively about who and what we are, about the activities we engage in, about the kinds of societies that we inhabit, and so on. I, and I think, you know, in my stock speech to um, prospective undergraduate students in philosophy, I always uh, emphasize the, the value and the virtue of reflexivity, of, of learning to be reflective about oneself and about the world one lives in. And for me, I think that is the, the single most um, valuable thing <clears throat> about philosophy and about a career in philosophy. Okay, so would you say that your career as an academic philosophy worth it? Um, <laughs> yes, um, I would. Um, I mean, it's, you know, it prompts the philosophical question, you know, what do you mean by worth it or worth it in what sense? <laughs> hasn't made me wealthy. Um, no. <laughs> that's not one why, why one would choose a career in philosophy. But um, again, uh, I've always felt that um, having uh, an academic position uh, in a discipline like philosophy, where it's pretty much possible to pursue your own interests, your own mm. intellectual interests, uh, and to have that as your day job, I think is just an extraordinary um, privilege and pleasure, in fact, yeah. to be able to do that. So to have a, you know, an, uh, a career that enables you to read and think and read and think about what you like to read and think about and to write about those things. I mean, yeah, I think it's, uh, it's an extraordinary privilege and um, one that, um, that philosophers should be very grateful to, mm. to have experienced. Okay, so on that note, thanks again, Professor Pettit, yeah. for sharing your time with us. So yeah. for you guys, uh, join me again for another episode of Philosophy and What Matters, where we discuss things that matter from a philosophical point of view. Cheers. Thanks, JJ. <laughs>